Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr Andrew Leinhurt. Um, he's a New Zealand trained consultant urologist. That was Andrew, who, if you didn't pick that up, who was just speaking there before. Um, he's a consultant urologist specialising in laparoscopic uro-oncology uro and kidney stone surgery. He also provides a full range of general urological expertise. He was born and raised in Christchurch, attended the University of, of Otago School of Medicine and completed the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons Advanced Training in Urology. Having completed his training, Andrew spent a year at St George's Hospital, Sydney, Australia, and then a year at the prestigious Imperial College, London. During those two years, he performed a high volume of laparoscopic operations and mastered comp complex laparoscopic skills. He performs radical prostatectomy, laparoscopic nephrotectomy. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> Um, he also learned some new novel techniques for managing urological conditions, especially within the field of kidney, uh, kidney stone surgery and sling surgery for male and female incontinence. In addition, he's been trained in laser prostatectomy for treating male lower tract uh, symptoms. Andrew divides his time between public and private practice. He's the first urologist to be employed by County's Manukau DHB. He holds an appointment at Auckland Hospital. In private, he's accredited to operate at Brightside Southern Cross Hospital, Ormiston Hospital and Ascot Hospital. He consults privately at 161 Gillies Avenue in a group practice with four colleagues. Currently, Andrew is also the supervisor of training for urology across the Auckland region. Andrew, we welcome you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Graham, and thank you all for coming. It's great to see a, a good turnout. Often, people often ask me why I chose urology as a specialty, um, and certainly a big part of that answer is, is the patient population. If you look around the room, it's predominantly male, and most of you are a little bit older than me closer to my father-in-law who's over there. And uh, I find that the older men are a very nice patient population to deal with. Wow. Truly, I mean it. No, telling, lies. telling lies, fair enough. Um, for this, I, I was given a brief to talk about prostate cancer from a urology perspective. Um, I have to go elsewhere at about half past two, so I'm not sure we can cover all of that in the time given, but we'll, we'll try. Um, the point I, I really want to make about this is that um, we, we're involved mainly in, in diagnosis of prostate cancer and treatment of early disease. Um, and it's a bit like a journey. And it starts with a PSA test, and that PSA test can lead you through to requiring treatment for your prostate cancer. Um, and along that journey, there's really three decision points, and I want to talk about those, those three areas today. And the first is um, you know, whether you undergo a PSA test. Uh, the second point um, is when you're referred for a biopsy and whether you undergo a biopsy. And lastly, there's a, a treatment decision if you get that far along the journey. Um, that first decision point is really about whether you undergo a screening test. Um, a screening test is, is testing someone who has no symptoms at all um, to see whether they have early stage disease. Um, that's a very controversial uh, area and I'm going to slightly avoid the screening debate. <laughs> Has anyone read this book? I think in this audience probably not many. Yeah, good. <laughs> I, I definitely wouldn't recommend it. I got to about halfway, a bit further along than you, and had to stop reading it because it's complete crap. <laughs> anyway, if we were going to put a label on decision-making in prostate cancer, this would be a very good label, Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, us as a collective group of clinicians, and me as a urologist, really struggle to know what the, the correct answer is in terms of uh, treating prostate cancer patients. And if we're confused, it's no wonder you, as the general public, find it incredibly confusing. Uh, to screen or not to screen? <laughs> this, is where the, this is where the shades of grey start. There's no, there are no clear recommendations about screening. Um, and I, I really don't want to get into the pros and cons of screening here because that really is a talk in itself. Um, there's a lot written about this and it's not too hard to find information about uh, prostate cancer screening. 
There are lots of factors, though, that will influence a, a patient's decision about whether they undergo a test. Um, family history, particularly if you've had a family member who's died of prostate cancer, is clearly going to influence that decision. Um, friends or workmates who've uh, gone through a prostate cancer experience. Um, we all have different views and outlooks on life. Um, some of us take the ostrich approach and uh, bury our head in the sand and don't want to know, so they probably won't have a test. Others, others of us uh, like to micromanage everything in our lives and have a test every six weeks. Your own GP, as Ross alluded to, is a, a really critical influence as well and they bring their own views about screening. Uh, and whether you like it or not, that will have quite a large influence on, on whether you have a PSA test. The main point I want to make here about screening is that it's not a decision that should be taken lightly. This is the entry point onto that patient journey, and it's a bit like getting onto, onto a conveyor belt. Uh, once you've had the test, it's a little bit hard to get off the conveyor belt. Um, It's really not uncommon for me to meet patients uh, who, when you ask them why they had the PSA test done, they said, oh, I, I, I don't know. It was just part of my normal bloods that my GP does, and he told me I had to come and see you. I really don't like it when that happens. I think that, unfortunately, you haven't had the opportunity to be involved in the decision-making that leads to quite, you know, potentially quite large consequences for you going forward. We'll move on from screening. The biopsy. The, I, I know there's definitely a few people in this room who've undergone a biopsy. I'm not sure that any of you have had one from me, but anyway. <laughs> you may not want to after this. This is about the only area in prostate cancer with relatively clear guidelines. Um, the New Zealand Ministry of Health uh, got together a task force uh, relatively recently to produce guidelines about when, pe when men should be referred to urologists um, and, and what the kind of thresholds are for considering a biopsy. And in my view, those guidelines uh, are very sensible. Uh, and in my experience, it's rare for a patient to decline a biopsy uh, once they've been referred to a urologist. Uh, how do we do a biopsy? Uh, so this is a picture of, of how it's performed. Um, we put an ultrasound probe uh, into the back passage or the rectum and the prostate gland sits just in front of the, the rectum or the last part of the bowel. And using that ultrasound, we can get very good images of the prostate. Uh, then we put some local anaesthetic injections around the prostate. And using a needle, uh, we take some samples of the prostate. Uh, we generally take 10 to 14 samples, depending on the PSA level, the size of the prostate, and how well the procedure is being tolerated. Um, most men tolerate this procedure without too much difficulty. Um, I wouldn't say many enjoy it, uh, but it is short-lived and it's tolerable. Although a relatively minor procedure, there are some potentially significant side effects from a biopsy. Uh, around 5% of men will experience a significant complication. Uh, these complications include uh, urine, uh, sorry, blood in the urine or blood in the stool, and most men uh, have that to some degree or other. In general, it doesn't cause a big problem. Uh, the biopsy can cause some bruising and swelling within the prostate, and that can make it more difficult to pass urine, uh, and a few percent of men actually get into a situation where they just can't empty the bladder at all and need a little catheter or plastic tube to drain the bladder. Uh, the side effect we worry about most is infection. Now, the, the bowel has billions of bacteria in it. It helps us digest food. Uh, and so when you pass needles through there, it's very easy to introduce some, some bugs into the prostate or the urine. Uh, and about 2% of men will experience a really severe infection that ends up uh, requiring them to be admitted to hospital for intravenous antibiotics. And very occasionally, men will get really, really sick from the infection. Uh, and in fact, some men get an overwhelming infection and can die from it. The estimated rate of death from a prostate biopsy is one in 10,000. Uh, thankfully, I'm not aware of any here in Auckland. Peter probably wouldn't know either. Anyway, not, not in the time I've been here. Um, where am I going next? 
And the, la the last point on our, our patient journey um, is the, the treatment decision. Um, and for most men who are diagnosed with prostate cancer, it's found early, as uh, Ross alluded to, when the cancer is still uh, in the prostate. Um, and for those men, the treatment decision is about um, whether you treat with curative intent, so aiming to completely get rid of the cancer. Uh, for some men, unfortunately, by the time they're diagnosed, they already have some metastatic disease. Um, and for them, for them, the treatment decisions are about trying to um, prolong uh, or prevent the cancer from uh, progressing for as long as possible. And I'm not going to talk much about that because it falls a lot into Peter's domain, and I, I hope he'll cover that well. I'm sure he will. The treatment of the cur curative intent, when I, when I meet a man with a new diagnosis of prostate cancer, the first question in my mind is, is, is this a cancer that actually needs to be treated? Um, we know from autopsy or post-mortem studies uh, that around one in five men in their 50s, uh, one in two men in their 70s, and virtually all men in their 80s and 90s will harbour small areas of prostate cancer in the prostate. Uh, overall in New Zealand, around 3% of men die of prostate cancer. So if we diagnosed and treated every single man who has a microscopic focus of prostate cancer, there'd be an awful lot of them who get treatment that didn't need it. Uh, and this is really the, the key issue of why screening is very controversial. Um, there is that saying in prostate cancer, you're more likely to die with the disease than to die of it. Um, and this is true in early stage prostate cancer, um, not in metastatic disease, as we saw earlier. Uh, and this is the rationale behind what we call active surveillance. Uh, active surveillance means you're saying, yes, you have prostate cancer, but we think that it's probably not going to, to catch up with you, um, and so we're going to closely observe it until such time as uh, either the cancer shows signs of progressing, in which case we can still go back and treat, um, or um, you know you get to 95 and we say, well, I think it's all right now. Um, there are factors that we look at in a prostate cancer diagnosis to decide who are suitable candidates for active surveillance. And I've put those criteria up there. Essentially a low PSA level, um, no large lumps uh, on the rectal examination. Uh, the grade is um, when the pathologists look at a, a cancer down the microscope, they um, look at whether the cancer looks similar to normal tissue or whether it looks really different from normal tissue. And that's what we call the grade of the cancer. Um, and if you have a Gleason grade of six or less, then uh, we consider that a relatively low grade. Uh, we want to know that there's a small volume of cancer, and we can determine that by how many of the needle samples had cancer in it, and what percentage of any given sample uh, was involved with, with the cancer. Uh, and finally, the patient's um, choice or patient's wish is an important factor in this decision making. Um, you may be wondering, really, is it, is it safe just to observe a cancer? Um, and the answer is yes, as long as you're careful about who you select. Uh, and uh, as long as close follow-up is performed. Um, this is some data uh, from a Canadian group. Uh, there's a professor in Canada who's been sort of one of the pioneers of active surveillance. Um, and uh, basically the sort of greeny yellow box in the middle that says 100% is the percentage of men who are still alive with their cancer. They've not died of prostate cancer. The overall survival, the 88% in the 10-year in the data is men how many, what percentage of men are still alive, so 12% have died, but they've died of something other than prostate cancer. So in this group of men who had just had their cancer surveyed, uh, over 10 years no one died of it. Um, and that's really the rationale for surveillance, because a lot of men won't necessarily need treatment. Uh, radiotherapy, um, I'm not going to talk much about radiotherapy today, it's a little, uh, it'll be a little bit unfair as there are no radiation oncologists here. Um, and I'm a surgeon and bring inherent biases to such talks. Uh, all I will say is that, that the cure rates for radiotherapy and surgery are similar. Um, there is, from a urologist perspective, perhaps some emerging data that surgery has a slightly higher cure rate, but it's certainly not a, a significant difference. Um, the main difference between radiotherapy and surgery are really in the side effects of treatment. Um, 
And for most men who are suitable for treatment of their prostate cancer, they would be suitable for either surgery or radiotherapy. There are some factors that would make us lean one way or another, um, but in general, most people are suitable for both treatments. Now onto the important part of the talk. Um, the surgery. Uh, so what, what does the surgery involve? Um, basically we do a thing called a radical prostatectomy. The radical means that we're taking the whole thing out with a little bit of the tissue around it. Um, it makes it sound very dramatic. Um, the prostate, as you can see in the slide, sits just below the bladder and just above the pelvic floor. And part of the pelvic floor is a muscle that, called your sphincter muscle, that keeps the urine in when you want it in and lets it out when you want it out. And the front part of the prostate is very, very close to that muscle. Um, we also take things called the seminal vesicles. Those are those funny looking things going up the back of the bladder. We, we take those out. They're really um, a part of the whole prostate complex. Um, and then on that slide you can see there's a nerve bundle labelled. Now, um, whether we take that nerve bundle out or not depends on a few things. If there's a cancer that's bulging out of the prostate and onto those nerves, then it wouldn't be safe to leave them behind, so we take them out. If uh, those, sorry, I should say, those nerves are to do with erection function, so they carry on down to the penis. Uh, now, if men don't have any erection function beforehand, there's not much point saving those nerves either. Um, but then there's a group of men who have good erection function and very early stage disease, and we will try and preserve those nerves. And that means staying very, very close to the prostate. So when you hear of a nerve sparing operation, what we're meaning, the prostate has a capsule or a lining around it, and that, that capsule is a little bit like an onion skin. It's got lots of layers to it. And so we try and get in between those layers and gently peel them off to try and leave those nerves behind. And that's what's meant by a nerve sparing. Uh, there are different ways you can do this operation. Um, there's a good old-fashioned uh, open surgery, um, or you can do some fancy newer techniques with a laparoscope, that means a, a keyhole camera, um, or a laparoscope that's controlled by a robot. Um, this is just a, a, a sort of overview comparison slide. Um, there is a lot of debate about which technique is best. Um, and it's a, a fairly complex debate, uh, and it is a debate. There's no clear right or wrong answer. Um, but I want to highlight a few things that I believe are, are definitely true when you're comparing these techniques. Um, uh, the hospital stay is uh, slightly shorter if you undergo a keyhole operation, um, but it's not a huge difference. You're talking a two or three day stay after open surgery versus one or two with uh, laparoscopic robotic. Uh, open surgery in general will be slightly faster than uh, laparoscopic or robotic to do. Uh, open surgery is much cheaper, um, the, particularly the robot is a very expensive device, um, but apart from the cost of the device, there's the cost of all the disposable instruments and things. Uh, the company Da Vinci that makes the robot, if anyone was smart enough to buy shares in them when they came on the market in 2000, their share price over 10 years went up 2000%, which tells you how much they charge for the robot. Anyway, um, and with open surgery there's a, a shorter learning curve uh, for the surgeon. A learning curve, what we mean by that is um, when you do your very first operation, um, unfortunately you're not as good as you are when you've done your thousandth. Um, and so there, there's a, a you know, a, a gradient, I suppose, of um, improvement in your own techniques and ability. Uh, and that curve takes a lot longer to master in a laparoscopic and robotic uh, approach compared to open. Um, comparing outcomes between these techniques is very difficult. Um, when the robot first came on the market, most people were doing open surgery, and if you're comparing a guy who does a thousand open cases a year to a guy who does five robots, well, you know, the open guy will do better. Now, a lot of data comes out of America, and in America, very few open operations are done and thousands of robot ones, so now there's a bit of a swing the other way. So it's, it's fraught with complexity to compare one method to the other. Sorry, I do, I'll just go back. I did want to say uh, one point, though, that um, what is definitely clear is that uh, a single surgeon's outcomes are 
are partly determined by the volume of cases they do. So if we do five cases a year, we are unlikely to be as good as someone who does 50 a year, who's unlikely to be as good as someone who does 500 a year. Now, in New Zealand, we don't really have the patient population or um, the kind of tertiary referral structure to have people doing 500 a year like they do in America. Um, and, a, and a high volume New Zealand surgeon would probably be doing around 50 a year. Uh, and finally, the, the complications of surgery. Um, down in the sort of light grey, there's a, no, a few things I've written. Now, they're all, all short-term complications that happen around the time of surgery. They get sorted out, things like wound infections, needing a blood transfusion, those sorts of things. They do happen, and it's not to belittle them, but they, are, they happen and they're sorted out. Um, there are two things, really, that we worry about in the longer term after surgery. Uh, incontinence uh, or leakage of urine, loss of urinary control uh, is one of them. Um, as I said, uh, when we had our anatomy picture there, the prostate sits right on top of that sphincter muscle. And so uh, when we surgically remove it, that muscle gets stretched and pulled during the surgery, and that impairs the function of the muscle uh, temporarily, or at least you hope it's temporary. Um, and so virtually all men uh, for a period of time after surgery will have some leakage or incontinence and need to wear incontinence pads. That improves week by week, um, and uh, the average length of time for needing to wear pads is around about eight weeks or two months. Um, you get continued improvement in the control or continence for up to a year after surgery, um, but at one year after surgery, around 10% of men still have some difficulty controlling the waterworks. Um, for some of those men, uh, they get leakage if they cough, sneeze, their wife makes them move the piano or dig out the tree. Um, and it doesn't really bother them enough to want a second operation. And overall, uh, about 5% of men undergo a second procedure. Uh, in general, if we do a, a second procedure for the incontinence, for the majority of men, we can cure it with a second operation. Uh, and the other longer term complication is impotence or erection dysfunction. Uh, even if we do a, a bilateral, so both sides, nerve sparing operation, uh, we will still permanently impair erection function in around half of our patients. Um, and uh, most men, when you talk to them about it, like, oh, well, it doesn't really matter. And then about two years after the operation, it's like, oh, damn, it really does matter. Um, so it is actually, it is very important. Um, there are factors that uh, determine how likely men are to get erections or, or maintain erection function after surgery, uh, particularly the age of the patient um, and the preoperative erection function. If it's a bit borderline beforehand, it'll be worse afterwards. Uh, and I, I'm not going to talk about outcomes of surgery because really the outcomes are determined a lot by, um, you know, people's PSA level beforehand, um, their staging scans, the grade of the cancer, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a little bit hard to, um, uh, to do that on a group basis. It's, it's something really at an individual level. And once you've taken the prostate out, you can get a very good idea about someone's prognosis. Uh, there's some very good nomograms out there, and you can plug patients' details into it, and it'll tell you a, a kind of 10-year figure of your likelihood of remaining disease-free. Um, that was all I, I had. Um, unfortunately, I've got to go at 2.30, so if you've got some questions, it's probably better now rather than later for me anyway. Have you got a question? Just uh, put your hand up. The, uh, Andrew's got the microphone there. Thanks. Hi, Andrew. Hi. Um, I am a physiotherapist, so really with my yeah. physio muscle hat on. When you put your slide up about the open versus laparoscopic, is there any evidence for the outcomes like incontinence and impetus if one is better than the other? Uh, no. Uh, there's lots of evidence, uh, one way or the other, in fact both ways, but um, I, don't, uh, I don't think there's truly uh, any single study that can show a definite difference in cancer control or continence or erection uh, function post either robot <coughs> or open. Okay, that's if you truly good. compare yeah. apples with apples in a study, yeah. There's lots of studies, like there's one recently published out of Melbourne where they uh, showed amazingly good results from the robotic operation. Uh, but when you look into it, the robotic operations were all being done privately by experienced high volume uh, consultants with you know, minimum 10 years experience and all the open ones were done in the public hospital by the junior registrar. 
uh, and then they, uh, I mean, I don't know how that was even published. So that's the sort of thing you're dealing with when you're looking at comparing outcomes. There's a lot of vested interests and bias. Andrew, do you have any uh, opinions or outcomes or information regarding cryotherapy? Uh, cry cryotherapy is rarely used in prostate cancer treatment. Um, its main role, I think, would be in what we call salvage therapy. So men who've undergone radiation for prostate cancer who then... Um, have a recurrence within the prostate. It's very difficult to surgically remove the prostate in those men. The radiation causes a lot of scarring. It's a bit like tipping a whole lot of glue down there and it just sticks it to everything. And it gets very hard to take it out. And so people have looked at other um, you know, ablative treatments of which cryotherapy is one. There's a lot of interest overseas in a slightly different technique called HIFU or high intensity focus ultrasound. Um, and when I, in 2012, when I was living and working in London, was involved a little bit in a trial uh, that's being run out of a place called University College Hospital there um, on that technique. Um, patients who are going to be suitable for HIFU are, in the large part, likely to be suitable for active surveillance as well. Um, and so I think um, that may be a little bit where HIFU runs unstuck. I think if you've got a, a high-grade, high-volume prostate cancer, it's unlikely that HIFU is going to cure you. But there's certainly potentially a role in the future. It's still experimental. How are you doing, young man? Good. How are you? Good to see you again. <laughs> no, I had um, Baraki yes. therapy about, what, nine years ago? Yep. Is that it? Can you not have uh, other, like, surgery No. Yep. Even though it are, is it too far gone sort of thing? Even though it's still in the prostate itself. That's a, that, yeah. Um, that's a good question. Well, brachytherapy is a type of radiotherapy, and so it has that, that same effect. Of a, it's a bit like it, it glues everything to the surrounding structures. So um, uh, it's very difficult to get the prostate out. Um, firstly, and the complication rates with salvage radical prostatectomy are very, very high. Um, at least 50% of men will end up needing uh, what's called an artificial urinary sphincter for their continence. Uh, and a, a fairly high percentage of them end up with bad stricturing or scarring problems. Uh, and the single most miserable patient, not because of the patient himself, he's a lovely guy, but he's miserable with his condition, is a guy who underwent a salvage radical prostatectomy. And I think you'll find uh, uh, most urologists are pretty reluctant to do them. Um, there'd have to be uh, very good reasons and a clear ability to cure the prostate cancer to want to undergo that. Okay. So I'm not offering it to you. <laughs> <laughs> this lady down here. Thank you. Hello. Is that yes, working? that's you. Okay, I have a question that relates to something that one of the statistics that Professor Lawrence says, and diagnosis, which you may be able to yep. help. So when he said that 20% of men with metastatic prostate cancer diagnosis yes. are still alive at five years, when is the diagnosis of metastatic prostate cancer? Yeah, good question. So um, when we do a, a biopsy, well, some men will get referred to us with PSAs even in the, th in the thousands. Um, and uh, sometimes we don't actually biopsy them because the diagnosis is so clear. Um, if your PSA is that high, you're very likely to have widespread metastatic disease. Um, and we would do a bone scan, and that may show lots of hot spots in the bones. We do it partly to diagnose the metastatic disease, but also to know where it is. Um, uh, we may do a CT as well to look at the lymph glands, and uh, that's how we would make that, that diagnosis. So what if, what if the bone scan, and that shows nothing, so... Yes, because I'm thinking it may not be diagnosed until you have the radical prostatectomy. Yep. yep. And then you see it's in yep. moved into other. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, there are after we do a radical prostatectomy, even if all of the surgical margins are clear and we take lymph nodes out and there's no cancer in those, there is still a recurrence rate. And for exactly what you're alluding to, I think that sometimes. 
cancer cells kind of escaped out of the prostate already and gone somewhere else, and you couldn't see it on the scan. So I think the question I want to, want to um, have assurance on, or um, maybe that's not the right word, yep. um, the metastatic prostate cancer diagnosis, is that the di diagnosis of the metastatic cancer or the diagnostic yes. diagnosis of the prostate? Yeah, so, so um, in men, uh, yes, you're, you're right. So it's um, metastatic cancer that you can actually see on a scan would have that sort of data. Um, after a radical prostatectomy, if the PSA blood test drops to zero, which you hope, um, uh, if, if it then becomes detectable, uh, it takes actually about seven or eight years before men develop symptomatic metastatic disease. And then the prognosis is on average is about another four years after that. So in that group of recurrence after radical prostatectomy, the average prognosis is more like 10 to 12 years. So, can so it's I, a different group. Can I answer some of that? Yeah. Our, our study was basically we went to the New Zealand Cancer Registry where there's a date of diagnosis um, and then we took all the men in our region and went back to their notes to see how many of them had metastatic disease when they went on to the Cancer Registry for their first diagnosis. So when I'm talking about metastatic disease at diagnosis, I'm saying if you take 100 men who are first diagnosed, the majority of them are men who have been picked up through a PSA test, but there are some men who have not ever had a PSA test who will present for the first time with metastatic disease, and that's around 12%. Then there is another group who often have had surgery, and at surgery have been found that the prostate uh, cancer has gone outside of the gland, and those are the ones I'm talking about, locally advanced disease. Mm. They're the ones who you know, early treatment with them, the prognosis is, is pretty good, but it's not as good as if the, the cancer was all within the gland. So they're the three groups. Yep. Yeah, with diagnosis of mm. metastatic cancer, is surgery an option? Uh, good question. Um, at the moment, I would say no, um, but uh, probably more in the radiotherapy literature, there are some studies coming out that suggest if in men with very low volume metastatic disease, so maybe you know one or two abnormal lymph nodes or maybe one bony spot. Um, in those men, if you treat the primary tumour, so treat the prostate, um, they may have a better long-term survival. There's a more work ongoing about that, and um, one of the think problems in prostate cancer is if you want to design a study to show a treatment benefit, you've got to follow people up for at least 10 years. It takes a very long time for that data to become useful. Um, and I think with time, we'll probably find that we may start treating uh, the primary tumour more often in that setting. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we're all done. Oh, one more? Okay. Oh, rats. Uh, I know you don't like talking about radiation. <laughs> oh, no, I don't but, mind at all. No, no, no. Uh, you've mentioned nothing about subsequent radiations to other sites. Yes. Uh, which uh, uh, seem to work in the sense that if you have it, and uh, you know, you get another remission for two years or three years or whatever, yep. and then maybe it pops up again. Yep. Um, can you comment on that a little bit uh, in uh, terms of prognosis? Uh, so there's sort of... Assuming... Uh, I mean... Yeah. Uh, you were mentioning figures of 10 years for metastatic diseases and then a further four years if... Uh, yeah. Uh, but was this for something with a high Gleason score or a low Gleason score or...? No, 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 that, that, that's... Um, uh, if you took all men who underwent a radical prostatectomy yes. and then had a PSA recurrence, because after surgery you expect the PSA to become zero. Yes. Uh, and that's... We don't do any scans as follow-up. We do a the blood test, yes. and if it ever becomes positive yes. after surgery, then that's a definition of recurrence. Yes. Now, it might be, say, say 0 0.2, and at that stage, if you did a scan, you wouldn't see any disease, and that's what I mean. And that, and that group of patients, all comers, and you follow them through, the, the average length of time until they get symptomatic disease is about seven or eight years, um, and then another four or five years after that in terms of prognosis. With radiotherapy, there's three settings where radiotherapy is used. Um, in treat, treating with intent to cure, much like surgery. Um, in what we call adjuvant or additional treatment. So they are men who have undergone a, a, a radical prostatectomy 
and either there's been a positive surgical margin, so that means that there could possibly be, be cancer left behind in the pelvis, um, or um, there's some other features we look at on the pathology if it's gone beyond the capsule of the prostate or invaded into the seminal vesicles. Um, in those men, uh, there is some benefit from giving radiotherapy to the pelvis after surgery. So that's the adjuvant setting. And then in what we call the palliative setting for controlling symptoms. So they're men with advanced or late stage disease. And in particular, men who get um, a metastasis or a growth in, in bone, uh, they can get a lot of pain from that. And if you give radiotherapy to that area, it, it dampens down the hot spot and alleviates the pain. But I think Peter may, I don't know whether you're going to touch on palliative RT. Probably will, yeah. Just briefly. Briefly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, that's it. Um, Andrew, we want to. Yeah. As Andrew said, he has uh, family commitment, so he has to go now. So unfortunately, uh, he's not going to be here for the panel later. But that's right. We've we've dealt with some good questions now. So Andrew, we really appreciate you no taking problem. the time on a uh, Saturday afternoon, family, and all that sort of thing. So no th thank you very much for being here. It's half time. Thank you.